Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Maximum Growth Live. I'm your host, Jay Ruane, CEO of FirmFlex, as well as managing partner of Ruane Attorneys, a civil rights and criminal defense firm in Connecticut. And with me, as always, my man down in the Sunshine State, making sure that he is enjoying the warm weather as I look at the dark gray skies of southern New England with the nice, cold, crisp air. Uh, I am jealous of my man, Seth Price of Blue Shark Digital, your SEO firm for lawyers, as well as managing partner of Price Benowitz, who now has a residence in Del Boca Vista. Uh, and I'm going to come and take it for you from you when you come back. So Seth, how's your week going this week? It's going well. Uh, you know, excited to have our guest on today. Uh, you know, we've uh, talked sales in the past, and it's, you know, the very heart of what my, my client management team is, um, as well as trying to figure out how to take myself out of day-to-day -day blue shark. And we have Rob Lyme with us today, who is, you know, one of my favorite people in the sales space. Um, you know, I, my journey into this was a lot of friends in New York who run venture backed companies that have used a group called Sandler sales training and um, came to Rob through mutual business friends and have really enjoyed studying the science of sales and like best practices not at any, I think he'll talk about this today, about it's not a dirty word, figuring out how to leverage and empower your people to solve problems of people on the phone. And, you know, I've talked many times on the show that I think of ourselves as plumbers, you know, not as lawyers. The hot water heater explodes. Who's going to help you with that problem? And I think Rob has really helped me on that journey. Uh, so I can't wait to have him out here. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, a couple of years ago, probably more like 10 years ago now, I uh, I watched the um, straight line persuasion method uh, videos that were Jordan Belfort, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street. A lot of people know him from that movie. Um, and I actually had reached out to some friends because you were in New York at the time. I was coming up in New York at the time. I had a bunch of friends who worked in that industry, in that, you know, boiler room type industry. And I found a friend who actually had uh, the Stratton Oakmont objections binder. Uh, and so I got a copy of it and was looking at it as, you know, if I have people on the phone, because at that point we were, we started off doing a lot of in-person consultations. It trans it transitioned to a lot more phone. Now it's phone and zoom. Right. Um, and I don't know, quite frankly, if we're going to go back to having in-person stuff because people are a lot more comfortable with the the phone and 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 the, and the video stuff. Um, but you know, the idea of training yourself for sales is something that um, a lot of lawyers find uh, uh, abhorrent. You know, they they think of themselves, well, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a salesperson. I just do good work. People will find me. I don't have to worry about closing business. And in this day and age, that's just not reality, right? I mean, you know, they, 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 there are. Fewer fish in the ocean and more more fishermen out there. So if you can't close business, you're going to be in a real real problem, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, for me, um, it's just been an interesting journey. I, I forced myself to go into it. Um, I see a lot of people, we talked to Mario Godoy as a, as a guest here and others, who use the non-attorney salespeople. And generally, um, what I have found is I've always relied upon people who are just information givers and that they present so much information that somebody says, how can I live without you? And the idea that I brought some best practices to the table, um, you know, very excited. And, uh, you know, it, this, it's been, it's made a, you know, it, it's been an eye-opening experience for myself. Awesome. So I'm excited. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take a quick break? We'll hear from our sponsors. And then when we get back, we'll have Rob from Sandler Sales Training. And we'll have a little conversation, Seth, you and I with him about the role of sales in the service-based law firm. Sound good? Sounds great. Folks, we'll be right back with more Maximum Growth Live. Hi, I'm Jay Ruane, one of the founders of FirmFlex and a practicing attorney for over 20 years. Anyone who knows me knows how my firm runs on the systems we create, and it has allowed us to flourish, even in tough times. I spent years and hundreds of thousands of dollars until I finally figured out a way to engage my audience and drive top of mind awareness with social media. And what did I do once I figured it all out? I built a system for it, and now you can put that system to work for you. You see, we took the hard part, creating the content and finding the images, and made it foolproof. 
Every day you will have curated social media topics to post designed to make your firm constantly remind your audience about your firm, what you do, and how you can help. And the best part? You don't even need to hire a dedicated social media person to do this for you. In fact, you don't even need to hire anyone new. We designed the system to make it easy for you to delegate to your receptionist, assistant, or paralegal and have them execute solid social media for you in just five minutes a day. It's like having a content writer, researcher, and graphics designer at a fraction of the price it would cost to hire in-house. Sign up today for the Social Super System and start building your brand where your clients already are on social media. In this world today, if you want to grow your business, you want to grow your firm, you want to take on more cases and make a bigger impact, you have to have a digital blueprint. Statistically, throughout the time that we've been working with Blue Shark Digital, our law firm, the Atlanta Divorce Law Group, grew over 1400%. They truly understand where we're headed and how we want to get there. I have a team in Blue Shark Digital that I feel like has my back. We're thrilled to have Rod Lime with us today. He is a sales guru and a coach for myself in the sales world. Welcome, Rob. Thanks for having me. So I came to Rob as I learned about the sales world, for both Blue Shark and for Price Benowitz. I was looking for ways to up our game from a scaled sales perspective. And a number of my friends from the corporate world use Sandler sales training. And after speaking to Allison Williams, a past guest of our show, I ended up meeting Rob, who has done a phenomenal job of helping sort of not just train, but empower our sales team um, with sort of best practices. I was very sort of skittish on this as a lawyer coming in. You think of sales as like the enemy um, as something, but I, the entire team has been won over by Rob. And I'd love you to just talk a little bit about your philosophy because whether it's somebody's intake or whether it's some other aspect of business, sales is everywhere. And you've done a really nice job of sort of breaking down some of these fundamentals and helping a team that is not a traditional sales team sell. Yeah. Yeah. Seth. Well, thanks for that um, introduction. It's a really, it's a really good question. Um, number one, any, any professional services organization, or it seems to be a really, really common way to think um, in professional services um, organizations, sales as a dirty word. Right. So to me, one of the first things that um, I, I think belongs on the table is let's talk about our life collection of experience with salespeople and how it is overwhelmingly negative, right? And let's let's talk about um, how we can't think of sales as a dirty word if we are going to succeed in growing top line, profitability, um, closing more opportunities. Um, and also let's talk about why we, why we hate salespeople and how we can behave differently than the salespeople um, of our past experience has behaved to, to, to cause us to hate them. Um, so that's, I think that's a really important thing, you know, sales, professional services. Um, I, it's, it's not, it's not selling. I just talk to my clients and sometimes they pay me. Well, it, you know, you're in the business of influence, right? And, 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 and your prospective clients show up and based off of how the meeting goes, they either hire you or you don't. So yes, yes, you're in sales. Um, so to me, the, the first thing is like, let's acknowledge that you're in sales, whether you'd like to, um, or not. Um, and, um, you know, let's deal with it. Now, one of the things I was surprised at, and as we talked, I realized that our people were not salespeople. They were people who were smart, understood substantive areas like most lawyers do, or most digital people do. And then they would just present and were likable. And that would work. What I've been sort of amazed at is not knowing what I didn't know, which is much of life and sort of the sort of sponge that I found our people to be, that it was not a dirty word, but rather just best interpersonal practices to help get yourself to a win-win a, a conclusion. Yeah. So when you sell the right way, 
right? The quote unquote right way. Um, the, your prospect is more comfortable, right? Like the art of selling is about really at its heart is facilitating a great decision, right? Now, if you work for a great company and you have a great offering or you have a great product, or you have a good service um, and you have a marketplace advantage, oftentimes that decision is to hire you, right? Facilitating a great decision for your prospect ends up being that they should, they should hire you. Um, they, they're in front of you for a reason. They have a problem. The problem's impacting them. Um, they're likely in some way committed or can become committed um, to fixing the problem and you can help them, them fix that problem. So the, if, you are, if you are selling the right way, your prospect loves you for it, right? Your prospective client adores you for it. The conversation is 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 very comfortable. You know, we talked we talked about um, how we hate salespeople because the traditional salesperson is constantly applying pressure. Tell me yes, let's get started. Give me some money, and and everybody hates it, right? Um, the process, the prospective client hates it. The salesperson hates it. They just think that that's how that they have to behave. Um, to make some money and to do their job. And the reality is, is the opposite, you know, behaving in the opposite way um, is useful. Um, I, I don't know who originated the thought that you should never give your prospect an out. You should never give your prospect the ability to say, no, I want to string that person up by their thumbs or something because, well, what a terrible idea. Um, your, your prospect will not ever tell you the truth if they don't feel like the truth is welcome, Right. Um, one, one thing that they might tell you is I don't want to do business with you. They tend not to, that tends not to be their thought. They tend to want to tell you something critical. Like, I'm not sure I want to do business with you. I'm not sure the money that you're asking, I'll get the investment in return. I'm not quite sure you understand my problems. I'm not quite sure you're the right person to help me fix the problems. But if you, if they don't feel comfortable that they could share with you, negative thoughts about you include up to and including no, then you're never going to get any really high quality information. You're never going to get the truth. What are some of those things that you see? Because I think most of us, um, with few exceptions in our audience, are probably selling the way you found us, which was smart people that understood the substance that were likable. What are some of the things that you've seen? I'll give you an example of one that I really that I loved, which was especially during COVID when you're on a, uh, a Zoom, sort of at the beginning, talking to somebody about how much time they have for a call as a basic yeah. first step. I'll say to somebody, is it a good time? But the idea that you're both setting a, an, an idea of, of time frame and what next steps will be, which I think is one of the sort of the core tenets of Sandler. Can you talk a little bit about what are some of those sort of easy, I love takeaways. What are some of the things people could bring back to their team and say, hey, this is something you could implement you know, with a team that is pretty much nice people, but not traditional salespeople. Yeah. So the classic Sandler technique of, of upfront contract is appropriate here. And, um, you don't have to be in Sandler, um, to, 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 to use, um, the upfront contract or something that looks or is related to the upfront contract. You'll find a lot of times elite really actually almost all cases, elite level salespeople find a way to get prospects to agree to an agenda and an outcome every time that they have a conversation, right? And you can add time onto that um, if that's important to you. But great, great, and also it makes the prospect really comfortable, right? If you agree in advance, hey, how much time are we gonna take? Um, what's your agenda? Here's mine and here's how this meeting typically ends. The prospect's more comfortable and, and the meeting's more productive, right? It's very, it's very difficult um, to conduct a productive meeting if you're not, if there's not a clear way how the meeting is going to end. If you both, if you both don't agree how the meeting's um, going to end, what the outcome is going to be. And for most lawyers, that is a signed retainer. So the idea yeah. that you're going from here's a bunch of information to I, I, yeah. I love. I mean, I'll parrot back what I have learned, which is I, if we think we can help you, and you decide you can help us, we'll be presenting you with. A retainer at the end of this and sort of setting the expectation so there's not that yeah. awkward moment at the end of the uh, at the end of the interaction yeah. yeah i love i love the i love the i love presenting the binary some people do a couple different outcomes i love the binary hey seth this meeting always ends in one of two ways right 
One of those ways, and I like to do no first. One of those ways is that we we decide not to work together. It doesn't make sense. For whatever reason, you didn't see what you needed to see in me, or I don't believe that that I could help you. But if if either of those things happens, you'll be comfortable, right? And they say, yeah, you promise. If you don't feel like I could help you, you'll share that with me, right? Yeah, and you won't be offended if I don't believe I could help you that I share that with you. No, okay. And the other possible uh, outcome for the meeting will be that, you know, and sometimes it makes sense to outline the next step. I'll present you with a retainer and we'll collect um, a down payment and we'll decide what the next meeting looks like. Sometimes it's appropriate to get real clear about uh, here's what a yes means. Sometimes people say, you know, what we'll figure out in the end as long as we have a, a lot of clarity for what's happening next. Um, yeah, that's that's typically how that goes. And that is something that you'll that that someone can take away from a podcast and, uh, and apply today. Hey, team, why don't we, you know, every time that we have a conversation with any prospective new client, why don't we agree, why don't we? tell them, hey, typically the meeting ends in one of two ways. Are you comfortable with that? Do a no, no, yes kind of thing. And also ask them, hey, what are you hoping to get out of the meeting? Right? Like just just those two steps you'll find that that can can lead to to much more productive and much more comfortable meetings for the prospective clients. Jay? You know, it's it's really interesting to me. Somebody told me years ago uh, uh, when I was first first working for myself that the difference between selling and helping is only two letters and really that's sort of the the attitude you got to come in but one of the things that's interesting to me is that in law there are a lot of different sort of timelines for the purchase decision you know we've got personal injury where really all they need to do is sign their name on a piece of paper you've got mm -hmm. criminal law where something's usually happening in the next two weeks so there's an artificial urgency you've got family yeah. law that takes a little longer because you know, the first time somebody says the word divorce in their head is different from when it's on their lips versus when they go see a lawyer. And then trust unless, the unless you're the other side, unless you're the other side of the case. Right. And then you and then you have that artificial urgency. And then you got trust yeah. the states, which is trying to sell to people who don't want to think about the thing they have to insulate for. So really across the board in law, there is a lot of variability. But it sounds to me like no matter where you are on that spectrum some simple things like setting up the no, no, yes, can really help you identify. And really it should be, you know, whatever goes on in the middle is fine. The the intro is one thing, but you really want to end sort of like uh, Carrie Shrug or Mary Lou Retton uh, coming off that bolt. You want to stick your landing every time yeah. because that's going to do that. So I have a lot of pushback from some of the lawyers in my office about doing any type of selling because they think that, Selling as itself is, like you said, a dirty word. I pitch it to them as selling is more of uh, something that is a skill set they can use throughout their career. Can you tell me a little bit about how maybe uh, being adept in sales can help a trial lawyer explain and sort of sell their story to a jury? Yeah. Um, so sales is, is influence. Right. Great salespeople know how to influence great, great um, um, trial attorneys know how to influence. Um, and and there's there's I don't know if I want to call it pageantry. You know, there's some there's an aspect of of presenting your case. If you're if you're doing it in front of a jury, if you're doing it in front of a um a prospect, you know, trying to ask for a couple thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, a million dollars. Um, that that it, there's there's pageantry involved. Um, um, I, I was I was actually working uh, really closely and really deeply with a group today that I coached. That I was, you know, Claire, if if you were saying that to your kid, can I hear your critical parent coming out? Right, because I'm just not buying. You know, th there was a moment in the conversation where it's like, man, you, you've got to come after this guy a little bit in a nurturing way. And I need you to I need you to bring out your critical parents. So the words were right. You know, I was like, I, I, I agree fundamentally with what you're doing and I like your words, but th it's the presentation. Right. I, I can't I can't get behind. You're not going to have the emotional impact on the guy that, that you need to have. Um, with that, with that presentation and you have to be, you gotta be a little shocking 
in this moment. And, you know, I didn't go to law school. I'm not a trial attorney, but I would, I would imagine um, that, that being in front of a jury, there are those moments. Um, you also, uh, and this is coming from somebody who, frankly, I'm not necessarily that naturally that likable of a person, but you have to be, you got to be likable and you got to come across in a way. And um, um, I think great advice for a salesperson, a prospect, I think great advice um, for attorney to, to juries. You, I like when I'm in front of a prospect, it's, I want to find reasons to like this person. Cause if I can find ways to like this person, then they, uh, and, and I come up and I go about it pretty passionately, they will find a way to like me. Right. But I'm, I'm going to try to like them first. I think, I think that's a, I think that's a universal, you know, principle that you can apply to in both scenarios. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that's a challenge, I think, for a lot of lawyers is that um, they don't see themselves as being a salesperson in any way because they specifically went to law school because they wanted to focus so narrowly. Let's talk about how it <laughs> could be easier for a lawyer to sell because they truly are passionate about their product, right? I mean, these are lawyers who've devoted themselves to trust and estates or to family law. And they actually, it's not somebody selling a widget because this is his job and he makes good money doing it. I mean, the lawyers yeah. themselves seem like they should be naturally better at selling their services because yeah. they do have a passion for it. Can you talk about that and the role that truly like loving what you do and how that can impact sales? Yeah. So the, 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 I don't, Another myth about great salespeople is that we can, it's like we, you, we can close, like there's some closing, there's some kind of moment at closing or there's some kind of hard closing or there's, you know, the, the, he could sell ice to Eskimo. I don't ever want to meet the guy who could sell ice to Eskimos because he's a con man, right? Because Eskimos don't buy ice, right? Like, um, and, and every great, um, salesperson, and I think any, any salesperson that has, um, you know, a lot of, consultative uh, sales training has some kind of move in the end where there's, it's like, you have a problem. You want to fix the problem. I understand it. I know I could fix it, right? Like I got that conviction and they're telling you no anyway. And every, like the hardest closing move that I ever have, it's not, you know, give me the money. When are you going to tell me? Yes. It's always, it's something like Seth, why aren't, why aren't you, why aren't you letting me help you? Like, why, why will you not let me help you? Like, is it that you don't believe I could help? Is it that you haven't come to understand, you know, that I'm great at this particular thing and I have the experience? But um, I envision um, lawyers that are really passionate about their practice area that have a lot of experience um, get faced with prospective clients that that just won't get out of the way and let let me help you. Like, why are you in the way? And um um, it goes against there's sort of a social norm where somebody gives you, frankly, some BS and you just let them get away with it. Right. Um, yeah, Rob, you know, let me let me think about it. I'm going to talk to my um, my dog walker and make a decision and get back to you. And I'm supposed to go, hey, that sounds great. I can't wait to hear back from you. Right. But the reality is, is the, the best service uh, for that that prospective client. And, you know, you know, also, if I want to close the deal and make some money, too, is. Hey, I could appreciate that. Um, sounds like your dog walker's opinion is really important and I don't blame you for considering it, but I got to tell you, typically, Seth, when I hear that, you know, what that person who's telling me that kind of stuff really wants to say is, Rob, I just don't truly believe you could, you could help me fix my problem. Are you sure that's not what you want to tell me right now? Right. It's that moment where it's like, I could help you right? Why don't you see it? And why, why just let me help you get out of the way. Let me help you. Do you, do you think, you know, it, it's one thing for people to approach, um, you know, uh, somebody inside a store and they might have reservations about the cost of something. Do you think there's some social stigma when a lawyer says, Hey, it's going to cost you X and somebody doesn't have, or can't figure out quickly how they're going to be able to afford legal services in that manner? And do you think those yeah. type of let me talk to somebody is just a sort of a, a way to save face and not say, look, I, I think you can solve my problem, but 
I don't have the money and I'm embarrassed to admit I don't have the money because I just spent an hour with you and I'm yeah. never going to be. Do you think that it, it's sort of like a knee jerk reaction by the public and that's a, an easy way to not cast uh, themselves in a bad light? Yeah, it, it's it's possible because one thing, um, um, entrepreneurs and and people who make maybe a top ten percent income have have this problem a lot less than than um, you know the median household income. I live in Indianapolis. The median household income for the city that I live in is like fifty thousand dollars, right? So if you take the average household income of $50,000, um, that person tends to be fed financial and like the books that they read are written by Clark Howard and Dave Ramsey. And they are really uncomfortable going to find money that they don't have in that exact moment, even if it's the right thing to do to fix a really bad problem, right? Like somebody who makes $50,000 a year that has a, 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 a leak in their roof is unlikely to go borrow some money or find some money, even though it's the right thing to do at that moment to fix the leak because it'll prevent them from having to invest future money in, in house repairs, right? And um, from a sales perspective, one thing that um, um, this particular attorney in this fictional scenario that we're talking about probably isn't any good at because most people aren't is, um, so here's the problem is it worth this amount of money to fix that problem, right? You shared with me, here's the problem. Here's how it's impacting you. Here's what happens if you don't fix it. You shared with me that you're, that you're very highly committed to fixing it. So is X amount of money worth it to fix the problem, right? I'm not asking you about how much money you believe I should charge. I'm not asking you about how much money you have access to. I'm asking you, would that amount of money be worth it? Right. And what I want is a yes. And I'll go, great. So let me help you figure out a way to put it together. Right. Cause, they, cause they might not have it. Right. And right. they do think that they should be embarrassed about it. They really shouldn't. Um, but elite level salespeople also can help prospects put together money, find money that they don't necessarily have, or they didn't necessarily think that you were going to ask for because it's the right thing to do. Right. Now, a lot of a lot of lawyers in, in, sort of in that situation try to do this sort of pre-qualifying when they say, OK, you're going to yes. come to me. Uh, I bill four hundred dollars an hour. I require a five thousand dollar minimum retainer. Does that sound yeah. OK? And um, if it does sound OK, can you uh, can, then we can book your appointment? Do you think that that is a, a successful strategy um, or do you think that that can turn off prospects who don't think in the terms of? Uh, of of their own finances and finding that money because you know a five thousand dollar roof repair uh, can save you a hundred thousand dollars worth of foundation repair. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a fine strategy if you can get away with it, right? If you are hitting your goals, if you're making money, if you're getting referred, if you have more work than you could handle, um, that's a fine strategy if if you could afford it, if you can get away with it. Um, if you're in a position where I did 400,000 last year and I got to get to 800,000 and there's a real compelling reason and I can't wait to do it and I got to do it and I'm going to grow and I'm going to, that's a terrible strategy for that person, right? If you're high growth and you're trying to capture, um, 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 new, uh, new clients, um, a terrible strategy because it is going to, it is going to turn people off. So for the person who, who would prefer to capture, um, that prospect. I'm wh I'm way more interested in come in, let's have a conversation and have have the understanding that, you know, whatever it is, maybe out of every out of out of um, every um, uh, 10 intake meetings you have, you only get two clients or whatever your numbers are, um, you know, be comfortable knowing that there is, quote unquote, a little wasted effort um, in, in attracting um, um, new clients. But um, I don't know if I, I, I would absolutely I, I would absolutely get sick if if most of my clients, including my clients who are attorneys, would treat that prospect in that way, because that very easily could be an opportunity that we're throwing away. Gotcha. Seth, you got a follow up? So I got, yeah, I got a final question, which was yeah. I wanted to get 
your thoughts on the biggest mistakes you see people making? What are some of those things that like you walk in, you cringe and like would be low hanging yeah. fruit for our audience to try to change? Yeah, I, I hate, I hate to be cliche. I hate to be cliche, but um, I have got, so entrepreneurs, including attorneys um, who hire me, um, tend to be hard driving, got to grow, got to do better, um, intellectual humility, right? I, I don't I don't know everything. That's what Rob's for. Um, but you would be surprised by the amount of people who have it together, running a profitable business, making some money, don't have goals, right? Don't have key performance indicators tied to their goals. So like one of the first things that I want to do in an organization is what are we getting to? And on a on a daily um, um, uh, time frame, what kinds of behaviors does everyone in the organization need to be engaged in for us to get um, um, to this to this place? Um, a second thing is a uh, a milestone. And here's the sales word, right? So we're going to stay away from it because um, sales is a dirty word. But a milestone centric sales process that is properly sequenced. Um, there's this, there's this sort of breed of, of sales professional and probably attorney who, who, um, feels that it's a bragging point that I wing it, right? They just show up and I, I just wing it and I wing it and I wing it. Well, that, that unfortunately is not, um, that might work for, for a single employee, but that's not a scalable, um, approach. So most, most companies, um, including professional services, including um, uh, law practices, don't have a properly staged sales process um, that is um, staged with the right sequence in mind. I love it. I mean, some of the stuff that you're telling is the stuff that, you know, if you really took a step back and look at, at, at a hundred level, a hundred foot view, you could say, okay, I, you know, if I'm running my firm as a business, these are the things that I can do. But a lot of times our audience is in the weeds and they're not able to take that. So I really love what you brought to the table today here, Rob, because what we are giving us is stuff that we may know in our gut, but hearing that from an outside source, I think is really going to drive that type of thing. I know a couple of things I've already said, you know, I've got to make sure that the people on my intake team listen to this episode because there's some really good stuff there. I really like the no, no, yes, anchoring um, and making sure that, you know, when the call goes from the intake person to the sales lawyer, they're going to say, okay, here's the process that the sales lawyer is going to grow. They're going to talk to you. And if they think that they can offer you our services and you fit, they're going to pass you back over to me so that we can talk about executing the contract and retainer. And I really love the way how that's sort of a roadmap to hiring as, as, uh, as we go. So uh, thank you for that. That was really phenomenal. Seth? Yeah, no, I was going to say as a compliment to Rob, um, I'm pretty cynical about this whole space. The, the traditional salesperson I think of who's like, to be honest with you, the moment somebody says that, I like shut off. I'm like, no, lie to me. And it becomes a whole back and forth. So, but what I could say is, when I brought my team to you, I was expecting pushback. I didn't know what to expect. And I was pleasantly surprised that it was it was not just it was not just taken in but appreciated and that people were already trying to say, hey, I could try it this way or that way. And all of that was uh, you know, so I appreciate it. And thanks for coming on today to sort of uh, share some of this information. We'll have your information in the comments for anybody who wants to get a hold of you and uh, talk talk more more detail. But thank you for all that you've done for us and Jay, any, any parting words? No, I just thank you so much. I definitely think my team is going to be reaching out to you because I think, you know, having a plan and, and like me, you know, my love for systems, you know, having a system in place that your people can rely on, um, even if they don't have to use it um, at, literally as a script, but they know they have that to rely on and, and hit those waypoints, I think is going to make your KPIs, uh, you know, function. And, and that's going to allow you to know where you're where you're winning and where you're losing in the, in the sales process so no matter if you're a trust lawyer or a personal injury lawyer these are the types of things that matter to us long term so rob thank you so much for being with us today yeah thanks for having me guys appreciate it take it, take it easy
All right, Seth, great stuff there. You know, we had some conversations, a little technical difficulty in it, but, you know, when you're in a live show, that's that's what happens. But I got to tell you, man, the more I think about the role of sales, I think it not only it helps your business get to the next level and grow when you have a defined sales process uh, instead of a haphazard sales process, but I also think that there are takeaways that lawyers who deal with the public, who have to convince the public, um, you know, in, in trial settings can take some of this information uh, and use that to better their legal skills as an attorney. What are your thoughts? No, look, it, whether it's your, your trial skills, whether it's dealing with opposing counsel, whether it's in HR, whether it's with client acquisition. I mean, these are tried and true issues that we deal with along the way and there's no fairy dust it's not like this is remarkably changing everything overnight but it's just tweaking what you're doing and putting thought behind it creating you'll love this systems in place so that you can replicate what you're doing over and over again rather than some person you're delegating to sort of wing it and that's uh that's why i've enjoyed uh you know digging deeper into this yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, even if you go to McDonald's, right? McDonald's has a sales system. If you don't order French fries, they say, would you like fries with that? Uh, and that converts people to say yes, right? And and these are multinational corporations that has a very simple sales system that they inter integrated across the board. And we're talking about lawyers selling thousands of dollars of services. Just a little tweak to your sales process, the language that you use, the order in which you do things can really mean the difference between growing your firm exponentially or stagnating. And unfortunately, if you're stagnating in the modern world, you're dying, right? Don't you think? Absolutely. Now, so one of the things that interesting, you know, getting off of the, the sales thing, one of the things that came up and I want to talk to you a little bit about it, because I think it's something that we're going to be able to talk about in future episodes um, is... A question came up in the Maximum Lawyer big group this week about what advice can you give somebody who was went from a very small operation, one lawyer, one assistant, and has had sort of explosive growth in a year. Now multiple lawyers, multiple staff, and that lawyer finds herself in a quandary because now she needs to do more managerial stuff. And that's really sort of something that I think we need to talk about a little bit more because everyone likes the idea of growth and scale, but not everybody wants to be a manager of people. I know I have decided I don't anymore after 20 plus years, I'm getting to the point where I, you know, I want to be sort of the visionary role, but you have to have a pretty big operation to have the role of visionary. Um, you know, because it's essentially is a, a you know, it's, it's a it, it's it's a chair that um, it doesn't really necessarily add to the bottom line on a day to day basis. So what are your thoughts generally about preparing yourself for that scale um, so that people can start thinking about it a little early? And I just want to pique your interest in it, because I'd like to talk about this on a future episode. No, no absolutely. And I, you know, to me, it's something I struggle with. Um, I have put layers of management and I think Part of it is elevating your admin to office manager, eventually to firm administrator. That's the, the general track that people follow in our world. But you know, as I've scaled and I've scaled aggressively, certain areas have scaled more easily and certain areas I have, you know, when you turn a blind eye, it's one of those areas where it, and you aren't managing. When you take your eye off of something, it generally causes issues. And I have a division right now, small one, where... I've empowered somebody to manage their team and they have made it very clear they don't wish to do that. So it's like, um, this is a microcosm of this. And those are the situations where you're like, where it's so hard because, you know, right now that person you're talking about, she's trying to manage, let's say three attorneys. Good, good for them. But what I see then is when that, when you have one of those three attorneys managing people, that's sort of the level that I'm dealing with right now is how do I ensure that each of the direct reports is managing the people the way you need them to do. And some of this is training. So I hope we're able to bring some guests on to give some greater clarity to that world because it is, it is difficult. I'll sort of leave with this thought, which is I remember interviewing for jobs back in the day. And people would always talk about management of people and it was how many people you manage. And it was all part of that sort of ethos. Of it. And I always thought to myself, and you made more money the more people you manage. But I was always like, you know what the, the aspiration is? To find a job where you manage little to no people 
and make that same money because managing people is a huge headache. So, you know, I, the, the lot I chose in scaling a firm, many people have managed, but there are people out there with a very expensive widget that have little to no people. And that's always sort of like grass is always greener. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of management of people, I want to see how's it, how's it going. We talked on Tuesday about your use of uh, fifteen five to start getting some feedback. Have you? I actually went back in and and, and took a look at my questions, and, and and it's interesting. I've been doing it for so long. I have two thousand of those surveys in my uh, in my file folder, and what I did is I tasked the VA to log in. And go because one of the questions I have is, "What's your one big idea? What can you know help us out, make us faster, that type of thing?" And uh, I tasked the VA to go back and give me a list of just those answers because I have a feeling there's some nuggets there. So, folks, if it's something that interests you, be sure to check out Tuesday's episode because uh, there, I show my questions that I use uh, for my weekly uh, check-ins with all my staff and all my lawyers, but you know, you know what you should do, do is I, I should get one of the, uh, 15, five people on one of the future episodes. Cause uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, college buddies, uh, C, C, C suite there. Let's see if we can uh, get somebody there to sort of talk about what they've learned over the years. See folks, this is the problem. When you go to Penn, like Seth, you have oh. these friends from college who, uh, who, who have connections and build industries and that type of thing. I went to school in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, my college friends own parking lots in Manhattan, uh, uh, waste management services uh, in northern New Jersey, uh, and bars and restaurants. We're more and, and probably a lot class. wealthier than my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, who knows? Who knows? I, I, I know they may not pay as many as much in taxes as your friends, but that's because they have chosen to be in a cash business. But that's what it comes down to, folks. Seth is the guy with all the connections. I'm just here for uh, for comic relief. But I want to thank you for being with us again here on Maximum Growth Live. I am Jay Ruain, CEO of FirmFlex, your social media marketing company for lawyers. And I would invite you, if you love systems, please join our Facebook group. It's called Systemizing Your Law Firm for Growth uh, so that we can give you the systems you need to take on little projects that can make a great deal to your bottom line. I love systems and I love talking about them. Seth, he is Seth Price. He is all things digital marketing. Everybody in the world seems to know who he is. It's amazing when I go to any legal event uh, and somebody says, oh, do you know Seth Price? He's the most well-connected person in the legal space nationwide, uh, and he is the founder of Blue Shark Digital, an SEO firm for lawyers, as well as Price Benowitz, your D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina law firm. Thank you for being with us, Seth. Anything else you want to add? Yep. Have a great weekend. All right. Have a great weekend, folks. Bye for now. We'll see you next week.